recording. And Mr. Chair, you are here to call the meeting to order. This is uh, Patrick Fisher, today's uh, interim chair. Yeah, interim chair, uh, Tuesday, May 16th. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. And we can do the roll call, please. Yes. Member Strickler, absent this time. Member Schwarzer, absent this time. Member Fisher, here. Inman, present. Keats, present. Langdon, absent this time. Shin, here. Taylor, here. Perfect. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, item A2, public comment. I haven't uh, received any cards. Uh, there's, uh, just need to check to see if there's anybody online. If anyone on Zoom would like to give public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom window to indicate that. I'll give you a minute. Mr. Chair, we have no public comment. Okay, um, item A3, approval of the agenda. I have not been informed of any uh, revisions that need to be made, so. I do have one revision, Mr. Chair. The development item on tonight's agenda, item D.2.1, LDC 23-00060, Meadow Creek Condition 15 Amendment has been removed from this agenda. They've requested to come before the or to NAB in June. Uh, but they let us know after the posting date for the agenda, so I couldn't uh, post an updated version. So they will not be coming tonight. Okay. And that's the only change. That deals with that. Um, so with, with that amendment, I will move that we uh, accept the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, item A4, approval of minutes. Does anybody have any revisions or notes to place into the record for the minutes? We have to approve the minutes from the February 21st now meeting. Wait a second. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. Item A5, council liaison report. Well, first of all, hi, everyone. Sorry I can't be there today in person. I was a little under the weather. Didn't want to risk exposing anyone. Uh, on Definitely on the mend. No biggie. I'm sure I'll be back on the saddle tomorrow. Um, a bunch of stuff to report. Um, first thing I wanted to ask everyone is um, we're down a few members on the NAB. I've uh, gotten some people that have applied, but I wanted to encourage any of you to um, encourage, you know, if you know someone that you think would be a good candidate to join the NAB, um, to encourage them to apply and let me know if you are encouraging them to apply. Uh, next item is I just wanted to say, I think you all know that I serve on a number of boards and commissions in my role. And um, um, one of those roles is, uh, I'm chair of the Washoe County Animal Services Advisory Board. And um, this advisory board advises the county, which is acting uh, collaboratively for Reno and Sparks and the county in managing animal services. And so um, we advise them. But recently, you may have read in the paper or seen on the news that there have been some challenges, not with the animal advisory, process or services, but with the Nevada Humane Society. And um, what it is, is that about 15 years ago, Nevada Humane and the county decided to um, set up a joint facility. One half is the county, one half is a nonprofit. And the animals come into the animal services. They're either dropped off, they're found, they're hurt. It's a result of a hoarding case. Um, any number of reasons, maybe they're lost or, or maybe they lost their family in a fire, whatever. Um, they come to animal services and they do their thing. And then they, it's up to a five-day hold. And then they transfer the animals over to animal, over to Nevada Humane to get adopted. And the problem has been that um, 
you know, there's been some breakdowns in the management at Nevada Humane Society. Apparently it's been going on for some time. But what happened was I had uh, posted a regular notice for a regular meeting to have Nevada Humane come in and present their audit. So both animal services and Nevada Humane um, are required to have a basically an audit every five years. And so um, the audit was done about a year ago and um, we had never gotten a presentation. We'd gotten one from animal services, but not from Nevada Humane. So we scheduled that and at that time, about a week out, around the day I posted it, I started getting letters from the public, from current employees, former employees, uh, people that have volunteered their donors um, about challenges and problems at Nevada Humane. Maybe they saw that word Nevada Humane assessment, but it inspired them to write. And many of the letters I would have to term whistleblower type letters where they're alleging you know, breakdowns in communication or processing at the agency. And I'm in no position to validate whether these letters and the issues that they're identifying were correct or not. But at a certain point, after you get five letters, then 10 letters, then 15, then 20, then 30, you know that there's some kind of major issue. So at the meeting, um, unfortunately, the head of Nevada Humane Society did not show up to give his presentation. And that only added some fuel to the fire. And then the letters really started coming in. Um, one letter alone by one letter writer covered some 300 pages and was also submitted to the attorney general and to IRS for some complaints about fiscal uh, mismanagement. Again, don't know if any of that is correct, but the upshot of it was uh, by the time, so I scheduled a separate meeting, a special meeting. We only meet four times a year. I scheduled a separate meeting and that meeting was yesterday. And it, it ended up being about a six hour meeting where we heard presentations um, from a variety of people. But what had happened between the regular meeting and this special meeting was that the CEO had resigned. Three board members had resigned. They had a new board leadership. Um, and there were a number of other changes that take place. And in fact, the very day yesterday of the meeting, the board had um, hired an interim CEO the day before Sunday. So anyway, it was a very productive meeting. And I'm just, I'm just telling you all this basically because A, your residents, Reno is a very pet friendly town. People really care about their animals and very invested. You know, we're a, a town that runs on nonprofit, the work of nonprofits. And, um, you know, as residents, you would likely be interested in them because it's taken up a lot of my personal time as far as council time, I should say. I thought you would want to know about it. Um, and I'm about to leave it there. I think if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them or I can move on. So, okay. so yes. Yeah. Um, I, so is there a continued investigation about the alleged animal abuse and fiscal irresponsibility? Yeah, so the IRS and Attorney General's office will be doing their own separate investigations. And again, I have no oversight over the Nevada Humane Society. It is a nonprofit. It is governed by a board of directors. I'm sure that the people they pay the most attention to are their donors, um, you know, in terms of who are they accountable to. Um, they have set up a hotline so that um, concerns can now be vetted by the board instead of having a management intercept there so that the board is more cognizant of what's happening. Um, they say they are following up on investigating. In fact, I guess May 22nd, they're having a, a some type of an investigation. I'm not sure by who, uh, but they'll be analyzing some of the complaints, doing walkthroughs and so on. So um, yeah, it doesn't begin and end here with a new interim CEO. They're going to start a nationwide search for a permanent CEO. Um, they're taking it very seriously, obviously, just the fact that there's been this amount of turnover. Um, but in terms of turnover, they've also lost a number of employees that were either fired or quit um, due to concerns about management. So they've got a, a lot of organization rebuilding to do as well. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. 
Well, anyway, the one note I'll leave you on is I think it is in the process of being turned around and, and we can all feel pretty good about that. A lot of people are coming out of the woodwork offering to serve on the board. And that is a beautiful thing. Um, the only challenge is that what they really need are some people on the board that actually have knowledge of animal welfare uh, processes and procedures and the business of. And so I'm encouraging them. I'm staying in close contact with them. And everything I've done is more in the um, question asking, uh, informal. Again, we don't have any direct oversight over NHS, but nobody does, but everybody cares. So I've, I've sort of stepped up into a void, I guess you will say, of uh, nobody being in charge and said, well, we'll at least, you know, push the process a little. So that's what I'm doing there. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, internally redistricting. And I think we talked about this briefly last meeting, but I know a lot more now. Um, so here's some things, and I don't know if this is of interest. I mean, we did cover it briefly last time, but um, so it's a pretty big change. Um, we'll probably see the biggest change in wards that we've seen in several decades. And the reason is, is because Usually it's an incremental process, um, but here we're actually adding a new ward, a six ward. And in order to do so, each ward has to lose somewhere between eight and 10,000 people. And that's a pretty big number. I mean, that's 20% of our population in ward two. And uh, I have learned that for ward two and ward four are the only wards that they're trying to keep somewhat together. Uh, that is because um, Megan Ebert and myself won election, and we are elected for four years um, to represent a ward for, you know, four years, uh, a ward two in my case. And it's actually considered something akin to a property right. So we have a right to our seat. We can't be redistricted out of our seat because we're elected past the date of um, 2024 past November 2024. My term goes to 2026, and so does Megan. So, however, I have found that they, obviously they have to reconstruct the boundaries of War II for us to lose 10,000 people, roughly. Um, and I have found that we could actually gain people too. We could take on part of Ward 1, uh, lose more than 10,000 people from Ward 2. Uh, we could become, we could even be, someone said we could be renumbered. So we could even become, those of you that live near me, because I have to be included in the ward, we could become ward one. We would still be a ward and we would still have me and we'd still be on the election schedule, but who knows which parts of this ward will remain. Um, there, we adopted some principles at the last council meeting last Wednesday. And the principles have to do with things like adhering to the 2020 census, adopting wards that are um, somewhat blockish. Most of our wards are long and thin. So going out to ward five, ward four, ward two, we're all pretty um, spread out. And that's apparently unique because of our geography. That's where people live. But with adding a six ward gives us a chance to become even more blocky. They still have committed to keeping communities of interest together. And so if, um, if you have opinions about this pretty soon, um, you're gonna be asked for those opinions and I encourage you to participate. Um, the process is gonna be conducted by a third party consultant who did it last time. Uh, a lot of people found that consultants work very good, found they listened. Uh, there was some concern whether we should have a independent redistricting commission. It sounds good, but um, you know, at the end of the day, who appoints that so-called independent redistricting commission? Well, that would be us council members. And so you could say that there's a relationship between let's say me and whoever I would uh, nominate and so on. So it's really just a matter of degree, but we're still all connected. We're still a relatively small town. So we decided for, based on our good experience with this consultant to go that route and have staff primarily carry the water the council members will have fairly little to do with it. The public will have fairly much to do with it. Um, of course, the public could say different things and I'll just give you word two. The public could say, well, hey, we'd like a ward down in South Reno. 
uh, we're, we're alike, we're suburbia, have a lot of similar interests. Uh, primarily, I've noticed it's families and retirees, kind of. Um, or uh, last time I heard like from Double Diamond, they didn't wanna be divided up. That was one of the proposals from the consultants was to divide them up. Also, there was a proposal to divide up Lake Ridge. We heard from them. We got about 30 letters from Double Diamond from all the different subparts of Double Diamond saying, we want to be part of the same thing. We don't want to be divided. So they didn't end up dividing. Um, so there's there's all kind of uh, other communities within Ward 2. Um, uh, there's um, cultural groups that hang together and so on and so forth. So I encourage you to participate uh, if you can. It'll be over the summer and by September 1st, so really in three months, uh, this work will be done and they will be proposing boundaries. And so there's two effective dates. One effective date will be January of 2024. That's the date that the um, county, apparently 90 days before filing, they can't move any boundaries. And that set, goes back from March 1st to February to January to December. Um, anyway, the the um, the county election officials believe that we need to have this done by September first. So the date of January is for filing, but nothing will happen to our ward. So all the same people will be in our ward until November of 2024. At the time the election takes place, that is when all the chairs will move on the deck and uh, we may gain some area we may lose some area in ward two um definitely will be happening you know they could have us going horizontal instead of lengthwise they could have us being virtually cut in half area speaking so a lot of changes are possible um let me just see if there's any questions on this well, yes this is how for the record um if you recall, this came up once before with regards to Lake Ridge Shore, as we were concerned about it. And one of the right. things uh, I'll touch on is, you know, you were elected for a four-year term. As far as we're concerned, we elected you to be our council person. That's that's an important issue for us, you know, and we determined that to a democratic process. So we certainly, the Lake Ridge Shores are, are very much, I think, you know, haven't taken a vote or anything, but I think very much we would like to say with Ward 2, we've been there a long time, and uh, and, and again, we very much support you representing us. I think that's very much in our best interest. Well, I certainly have gotten to know various parts of the ward. I know it was heartbreaking for me in some ways to lose Vir Virginia Lake area. I have built up such strong relationships. I'd worked on the lake for a long time. Um, I had um, uh, also uh, invested a lot of council money in the lake. I got in the Watt Street area into a repaving program, et cetera. And then to suddenly lose those just months before the election, well, before the filing was really rough for me, just mentally, but I, I have put it in perspective. I mean, I've thought, well, um, it's, it's like losing a children, no matter which way you cut it, it was hard. And um, I didn't want to lose anybody. Frankly, I built up such strong relationships, but I understand. And so this time I'm going to lose about 10,000 more people. There's no doubt. Could be more. Um, and how, you know, maybe Lake Ridge stays, maybe the heart of it gets compressed around where I live. And that's one of the challenges that they have is organizing around where the two council members, myself and uh, uh, Megan Ebert live. And, uh, you know, I ended up, literally half a block from the line and uh you know that's just the way it was so i take i will certainly let them know that it's best coming from you hal not me and then donna had a question yeah i, I was even during the council presentation I, I was still a little confused about the two dates um like you know there needs to be a sixth ward in time for somebody who wants to run in that ward, I guess. So the two dates, can you just explain that yeah. again? Sure. So the first date, which is basically January 1st, 2024, uh, we'll call that a date and name only, meaning 
theoretically, so you'll see the boundaries and somebody that wants to file for office can see mm -hmm. the boundaries and know where they will be living come November, 2024. It's like an early warning of what it'll look like in November, 2024 to allow people that wanna run, they will know what the boundaries are. And for example, people that let's say it's Lake Ridge stays with, in Ward 2 with me. Well, nobody in that area can be filing to run come March because I'm still in the seat. Uh, but let's say, I'm just gonna pick something. Let's say they carved off Double Diamond. Uh, Double Diamond would not be with me. That means they'd be with someone else and, and probably uh, open seat. Somebody could run. So do you, did that help or do you need me to say more? What's the second date? The second date will be as soon as the election is certified. Uh, let's say they carved out some part of South Reno. Suddenly, as of November 2024, I would no longer represent um, that area, but a new person would have been elected that did. Or let's say I didn't cover Huffaker anymore, as another example. Maybe they draw the line down Virginia Street, for example. Uh, I had been representing Huffaker over there and all the South Reno stuff and even uh, apartments around Meadowood Mall. Those could suddenly be in another ward and that ward would be open for election. The person could have filed, could have been elected November, 2024. As of that date, Huffaker, South Reno, let's say would no longer be part of ward two on that date. But up till then I would represent them. So, so I, I will I, lose 10,000 people somewhere, maybe more. Um, and I won't lose them though until November of 2024 is when the official switchover date is. Okay. Does that help? It does, thank you. Okay, and anyone else? I, I have um, two questions. So sure. has there already been proposals submitted or like maps drawn out to give like a general idea? Okay, and when they are submitted, who is going to be um, the person or persons that are approving it? Would it be the city council, uh, the county, the governor, so to speak? Like who would basically? Be? So it will be the, the city council will be approving the maps. Okay. No other body, not the county, not the governor, nobody else, not the legislature. Um, and um your first question i wanted to say make sure i say words was would you say it again um has there already been proposals oh, submitted like maps yeah. drawn out to give like a general idea no okay. so the staff member that's going to be in charge of this is again callie wilsey she did it last time she works under jw who's an assistant city manager and then this consulting firm, uh, for the life of me, cannot remember the name of the firm. Same one, though, as last time. They will take all the principles that they did a lot of work last time to analyze where the people live in Reno. So they know where the population pockets are. They know what the principles are, which are to get things blocky and close together and like with like and keep uh, communities of interest together. They're going to be looking to do those principles even better than they did last time. Anyone else? Okay. All right, well, then the last thing I wanted to mention to you, well, second to last, first last is uh, we will be adopting the budget next week. Um, there is a proposal, we, we, didn't ha we weren't adding any police officers. There is a proposal uh, routing around. We're trying to figure out how to add somewhere between eight and 10 more officers, a team. And as I understand it, the focus of the team would be on patrol, um, not on special units. This is the number one issue I hear about probably is, why do we not have police officers on patrol? Why can I not get a police officer? Why will no one come investigate the crime that happened? Someone broke into my car, garage, house fill in the office, work, fill in the blank, um, and no one came. And people feel somewhat abandoned by that. You know, we, we don't have enough staff to go around, but I think in some ways we've sort of thrown up our hands and said, well, we'll never have enough staff. And so some of these things have come off the table, writing tickets, 
being on the scene quickly. If you're driving around an area and a crime occurs, being able to be there quickly. So um, we're looking at some pretty dramatic ways to get the money to do that, which would cost over $2 million. Um, we're really struggling, but all this will be discussed next Wednesday when we do do a uh, final budget adoption. So I wanted to let you know about that. Um, and every board I'm on will be, most of them will be adopting budgets this week. So I have like four boards I'm on will be adopting budgets later this week. Um, so there's that. Um, I have been working to get a few of the commissions that I liaise to elevated in terms of having a little baby budget to spend. So if you're in historical resources, maybe it's an event like we had last week to celebrate our historic award winners, which there were five businesses and they were totally amazing. Some of them have been in business over a hundred years in Reno. So we got to celebrate them. It might be the um, Urban Forestry Commission. You know, I help them with awards too on Arbor Day, um, award ceremonies. And we're always scraping money together to support these activities. I don't know that I'm gonna succeed this time around, but I am gonna keep working on it. Right now, I've mostly been given my council money to help these commissions that I work with, you know, do a little bit more. Um, I'm hoping to institutionalize that. So that's something I've been working on. The budget is pretty flat, um, even though, and I'm still kind of puzzled about this, even though there is an increase in money at the state level for a variety of things. I mean, they've talked about an extra billion dollars or something, or millions of dollars to go to education that weren't there before. The city is seeing relatively no change. Um, luckily, we're not going down, but we're not really going up either. And uh, so there's been a drop in some revenues and an increase in others, and they balance each other off. So we have a pretty flat budget. Um, so we're struggling to add a few people in this world of flat budgets. So, so that's, that's what's going on in the budget. Any questions about that before I hit my last topic? Um, yes. What time is the budget meeting going to start? Um, well, it's uh, it's our whole council meeting and the budget is just one item and it's kind of uh, in the middle of the meeting. So that could easily be around the 132 time frame, something yeah. in there. But, you know, if a person absolutely wanted to know what was going on, you'd want to start at 10. Um, right. There's the public comment and so on. So. Unlike our other budget meetings, which were all day, we started at the 10 o'clock and it was all about budget. Anyone else on that? Okay, last thing. Uh, for years, this group has been interested in the Dutch brothers. Um, I think everybody recalls that they were issued about 12 to $13,000 in fines, primarily for stacking in Virginia Street opposite the convention center. So they were being set up for a hearing to lose their license, their business license entirely. I mean, they'd only paid about $9,000 of the 12,000 and they continued to violate the requirements of their permit. And so this is one of the first times the city's getting kind of tough. They don't generally go around yanking people's business license, but in this case, it was sort of enough is enough. Like, do you not hear us? Well, they did get the message. And so right before the revocation hearing, they asked, they, they instituted some changes and the city staff reviewed the changes and thought that they were significant enough that they could cancel the revocation hearing. And apparently they've been pretty successful in preventing the stacking. They have a flagger, they have a security system now. Uh, they wave people on and you know, people do get mad if they can't turn in, but that's just how it is. Um, and they have opened up another Blue Bounty, or sorry, Dutch Brothers down the way a bit. They're looking at opening yet another one in that general area because the demand's so high. Um, well, they also looked at their business model, which we talked about last time was to be very, very friendly and engage in conversation, which meant the line was longer. And they've amended that. They are also looked at setting up dual lines. They also looked at people taking orders outside. So quite a few changes, but I've encouraged them to add some land. Apparently they have, hold on a minute. <clears throat> Sorry, apparently 
they have made some overtures to their nearby land, uh, their, the people that own land behind them to see if they can acquire more land. And they have not been successful. So, um, you know, they're continuing to evaluate it. And I met with them since all this happened. They actually reached out, met with me. And what they'd like to do is come to the NAB and make a presentation, uh, both with their uh, manager who will now live in Reno, okay? And number two, include one or two people that work at that store, at that specific outlet of Dutch Brothers to talk about the issues and what they've done. So I wanted to give you an update because I know this is something you all have followed very closely. Um, so there's the update coming attractions. Any questions? Okay, well, that's great. Um, any questions in general uh, for me before I give the floor back to Patrick? Okay, well, that's it for me tonight. Uh, back to you, Patrick. Very good, thank you very much. That was, uh, it's good to hear that uh, the Dutch Brothers is finally getting this act together. Right. Uh, enough, enough pressure has been brought to bear, so. <laughs> And that'll be fun to welcome them here to hear more about it. Um, well, I think it presents the message that if other people are planning on abusing that situation, that the city will, in fact, be proactive on it. That's a good message. I think it's critical that we have teeth to our permitting system. I've always felt that way. One of my first government jobs was managing a regulatory department. And I, I knew that enforcement was key. And I, I see we have a police officer here in the room um, and I'm sure that he would agree. Definitely. Um, thank you. And uh, we will move on to item A6, staff liaison report. Hi everyone, Tyler Shock, community liaison for work to the record. Um, I just have a few things on my update follow up here. I did want to let you all know that the spring or two community cleanup is next weekend. And Saturday, the 20th, it's going to be at Damani Ranch High School. It's going to feature hazardous waste, e waste, and regular waste. Um, there's, you don't need to bring an ID or any um, proof that you're a waste management customer or anything like that. It's going to be from 9 to 12. And they're not going to open the line likely until nine o'clock to make sure that um, things don't pile up too much. But when you do come, like I said, they're taking hazardous and e-waste. So things like batteries, paint cans, um, they even take appliances, old stoves, um, anything like that. But we'll be sending out a constant contact to the Ward 2 newsletter um, soon so we can make sure everyone's got information on that. And they also sent out postcards to nearby residents to let them know of everything that's going on. Um, so that's my first item on the update. And then our next staff meeting will be on June 20th. Here, same place, same time, 5.30. Sure, thank you. June 20th. June 20th. Oh. All right. um, I just want to say, encourage you all to bring your stuff. And also, you know, feel free to come and pitch in. I know Patrick has before. Um, you know, I don't know what this story is with volunteers, uh, Tyler. So we've um, been gathering volunteers. So we will have volunteers at this cleanup. But if you'd like to volunteer, you're more than welcome to. Just let me know. Um, and I can coordinate with the person who will be running the cleanup. And we can make sure we've got you on the list. That person, Tyler. Uh, it's Sierra Lindsay with uh, Housing and Neighborhood Development. Who is it? Sierra Lindsay with Housing and Neighborhood Development, hand. Okay, I don't know that I've met this person, but look forward to that. Okay. You can set up a meeting. I'll, um, I'll be there as well. So there'll be a couple of faces at least. All right. Item D1, Dutch or to the Reno Police Department quarterly update. We have Lieutenant Dyer. Lieutenant Dyer here with us. Hi. Oh, wow. Just in case I want to put it in the minutes. Okay. This one for everybody? No, oh, and over here. Yeah. You see me? Yeah, I can see you on the camera. Uh, so I look at 
I looked at the stats and in War II, it's the second lowest as far as reported crimes. And the top three that I saw uh, that I went into and did some research on were the destruction of property, the stolen vehicles, and the crimes against person, because crimes against person is a pretty vague category. Um, and the crimes against person, I saw, uh, it's kind of hard to describe, there's really like a lot of stuff that's weird, like someone said something that they found offensive online, and it's like an arbitrary name thing on like a social media platform, and so they filed a report. So that gets categorized as a crime against person. And so there was a couple of things like that. Um, one uh, was a child abuse, but it wasn't, I mean, legally it was a child abuse, but a lady was mad about her order at McDonald's and went and like punched the girl through the window who happened to be, yeah, I'm not kidding. I, I read this and I was like, really? Um, who happened to be 17. So she was charged with child abuse, rightfully so, because if you're that mad about your order, you probably have other things going on. Um, a couple other internet things. One was a note on a car, uh, and it just said, like, I miss you. And so the person thought it was an ex-boyfriend, but it was just simply a note on a car. But we have we have some stuff like that that gets categorized as crime against person. Uh, we did have a couple uh, legitimate ones um, at the Sierra Center Parkway. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see the thing. Anyway. It was a, it's an inpatient behavioral health center and people got into a fight. So, I mean, there was some legitimate crime against person in there, but then it's also a mental health facility. So it gets counted for us, they're mandated reporters, but then it also kind of, I don't think it demonstrates community safety risk. That's kind of what I want to convey is, if you guys see stuff on here, you just see like a number and a case number and you want to go look it up, it doesn't really look that bad. So you see that number and oh, this is higher, but it's not always, what it looks like. Uh, as far as destruction of property, uh, I didn't really find a pattern as far as like to give you guys advice on what to avoid. It just seems like people like throwing rocks through windows right now. Um, everything I read was either a rock through a car, rock through a store window, rock through a plate glass window, a residence or an apartment as they're walking by. Um, some people suspected it was maybe an X or something like that, and other people had no idea who it was. So um, I would presume kids, but who really knows nowadays with the uh, level of drinking that goes on. And then a lot of people with mental health issues kind of normally think about things and then they go to jail, they're happy because then they get food and a shower. So, um, and then as far as the stolen vehicles, um, a couple of these uh, were embezzled where someone had a rental, either like a U-Haul or one of the, you know, enterprise hurt, something like that. And they just never returned it. Um, a couple of these are recoveries. So if someone steals a car from elsewhere and then they kind of abandon it in Reno, or we find it and we arrest somebody, like that counts in the same category. So it's not always just simply these people got their car stolen. Um, and from the reports I read where it was a legitimate uh, vehicle theft, um, I couldn't really find a pattern. Um, in the cold season, I talked to all the wards about not leaving your car idling with the car with the keys in it. And it appears that we've gone through that cycle, especially now that it's warmer. Um, but I did find a lot of, um, you know, windows like there was broken glass on the ground, their car's gone kind of thing. And it was primarily like densely populated areas. So you have apartment complexes, storefronts, things like that. It wasn't really like a single family residence, I think just because there's probably more cars there. Um, the only thing I did see as a pattern to warn people is be mindful where your keys are. So I'd say that was like a giant uh, stack of keys on my belt here. But um, if you if you lose them in a, in a store, like they fall out of the the car or your pocket or something like that. If someone finds it, they're just going to get the clicker. They go outside, they press it, tell your car alarms, and they'll take it. So I did see a couple of those. So um, the only kind of advice in the pattern I saw was be mindful of your keys. Um, and then also don't let people borrow your car. There's a couple of those in there where they borrowed and then they never gave them back. So then they, they bought them. Wow. Uh, I have a couple of other things. So that's all I have on the crime staff specifically. Do have any other questions about super exciting data? <laughs> I have a question, Patrick, yes. for the record. Um, as far as stolen vehicles um, citywide, you haven't noticed anything, a pattern of the Hyundai and Kia vehicles that have the, that are apparently easy to hotwire and can be driven? 
I believe by anybody. So when I look at these, because I have to look at like all the words I right. can't find. So it used to be 10 years ago, it was like the Honda Civic Sound Cores, like the mid 90s to early 2000s, and then any Saturn. Like I could think of screwdriver and start a Saturn because the tumblers wear down over time and the locking mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and now, unless it's like a proximity key, um, like the fancier cars have this. So if you have a push button start, you basically have a proximity key, mm -hmm. and those are a lot easier. But in time, just in and out, sooner or later, the tumblers and the lock uh, become easier to manipulate. Like we call them bump keys. And so someone get a key, um, and it's not specifically your key, but it's pretty close. And if they jiggle it and your car is old and worn, it'll get it to go. So if you have a, a stimulant problem and you're awake all night and you're like making a bunch of keys, you can try four or five keys in a car. Then you get when you drive tilts out of gas, you abandon it and on the next. And the, the rock throwing is, is interesting. I heard about a fatality in Colorado. A woman was driving down a highway and, and the kids threw the, the, the rocks through the windshield and, oh, yeah. and yeah. it killed her. Is this something? That is a, some sort of challenge online. Not that I've seen, and these are all so that's like a active thing. This is all like the part of an occupied vehicle. Okay, okay. someone threw a rock through the it's right now. And right away, and, uh, we got the report. And sometimes I've seen a delay in reporting too, where someone was out of town for the weekend, where they go to work and they come back, and it's like you have this eight or 10 hour gap in time. It's not like they heard it and go out and see it. So, but I haven't seen nothing was like an occupied vehicle. It's all. Okay. Hour stuff. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. I was going to say, uh, by, by the way, yeah, we had incidents like this one back in Illinois, too. If you're driving, not here, but maybe more rural areas, if you've got a bridge going across your, your highway, you see some people up there, be very aware. Sometimes it's kids just playing around, but a rock hitting a car going 70 miles an hour. Some that day. Yeah, yeah, it'd be absolutely deadly. Um, are we having problems with uh, catalytic converters being we were, I was going to ask. Um, so we were, and I don't think this board got hit as much. We did have a couple kind of in the double diamond area. Um, but generally, I, I generally see them more in the Northwest. Um, I think they like to be along 80 so that they can, because they generally, um, a crew will come up from somewhere in California, Northern California Bay Area, and they'll, like the Sawzall, like I can go to Home Depot and buy a Sawzall and the right blades and like, 10 seconds, I can have it off your car, zip yeah. zip, and throw it in the back of my truck. And so they would hit us at nighttime. Uh, they really like Toyotas, but they also like the Ford, is it the F two fifty, I think, but the gas F two fifty, not the diesel. Um, and so they were they were killing us up north. I didn't see as many down here, um, but we would get those crews, and they kind of come in intermittently, hit us, and then leave. Um, I think I don't think can't think of like a, an arrest success story that I'd love to tell you right now because. That would be nice. Um, but we did have people doing like cigarette thefts and they were hitting like all the 7-Elevens and kind of like little liquor store areas. And we did catch three guys doing that. Um, we put, I think, like eight cases on between uh, Sparks and County. Um, and so that was a good one. And I don't I thought they did a press release on that, but um, they, of course, have already bailed out. It's coming back to California, but um, I can't think of the cattle converters recently, like within the last couple of weeks or months. Yeah, thank you. And then I have excellent news because I know everyone likes to talk about street racers. Uh, we did, it says two ops, but we just hit it on a Friday and Saturday night in April. We had, here it is uh, 72 citations issued, two arrests, four parks towed uh, over the, those two days. And then I think uh, with our new chief, she's pretty aggressive toward these and sending the message. So I think we're going to, there's a uh, press conference tomorrow morning at the Reno Police Station at 10 o'clock in the morning. Tyler, did you already have that or? I don't, is that just a press release? Yeah, I can send okay. it to you. I, you I've got it. I'll okay. make sure it's, um, um, I'll send it out to everyone. And so they're kind of having, this is kind of what we've been waiting for. We've talked about this, I think, in the past. Um, we're going to have our chief of police, uh, Sheriff Balaam. Uh, Prop Forth over from Sparks, our city attorney, uh, Chris Hicks from Wash County DA's office. So we're going to have everybody in one room so there's no finger pointing. And so I think uh, they're going to come up with a collaborative plan. And then I think anyone else that has some input in that that wants to talk about it um, or has some questions uh, can ask those questions. Um, I won't be there because I won't be here. I'm going out of town. But uh, I think this is really important. 
um, for those that are interested that can show. And then on that note, I finally uh, have to like dime myself out, but I finally found the obscure law that does make the actual trick, they call it trick driving, um, but an unauthorized trick driving display, they did make it a gross misdemeanor. And then it's like two page law. I missed it previously because I was looking for the spectator aspect. I want the spectators to be a higher uh, thing than a misdemeanor for us to work on it. But the actual guy driving is a gross misdemeanor, which gives us a little more authority as far as our ability to like, go arrest them. Um, but as I've talked about before previously, I don't think it was here the last couple of times I've talked about these, but I brought a couple of copies in case anyone wants them. And I went nerd and did color related highlighting. Um, so I have a couple of these if someone wants them. Um, but the good news is on these is if everybody's on the same page and we're having an aggressive campaign, um, you know, we send a message to those people. And I think once we start towing cars, which I think there are some bills in the legislature currently. Um, cause this says currently it says a judge can order like the impoundment of the car after you're convicted, but that's months down the road. It doesn't really send the same message we want to, um, Las Vegas was awesome. It just had a big car crusher out the middle of the street and it would like crush everybody's car. Then they got sued. Um, cause they're like, well, you deprive someone of their due process and crush their car. And then the remedy, there's no remedy, right? Like I want my car back, but you crushed it in a big crusher and not scrap metal. Uh, now you have to pay me. That's like the only memory. So I thought it was great. I sent a good message. Um, but um, our chief being from Stockton, I think they have some innovative ideas in California. Generally, being more liberal is a little more restrictive. And so they had some ideas. Um, I attended like an online seminar. Uh, I think San Jose PD put it on uh, just with some ideas. And again, they have different laws that we do um, at the lower levels. So they, they did some stuff that I don't feel comfortable with. Um, but they had helicopters, they got like a hundred cops. And they like did like huge things on like thousands of people. So um, I think so they're just saying that as we come into the warmer weather, uh, we are gonna now aggressive campaign to deal with this. And we have people monitoring uh, multiple uh, media platforms, all these other kinds of things so we can track them, uh, get out ahead of it. But they, they know this, so they tend to drop the information like really last minute, like Thursday or Friday night. Um, and then it's harder for us to assemble because we have on track from other things. Like you can't just make me work on a day off uh, with two seconds notice. Um, for people, something like that, lives outside of our jobs. Um, but we have a couple options for how to staff it appropriately. So it will be a regional effort of the US, NHB, Sparks County, um, undercover units, smart units, traffic unit. We'll have a lot of people. I think we've had 70 something assets out at one time. Those are generally our more successful operations because we have enough people to deal with that. Sounds amazing. Anything else? This is a light room. What, what we got going on today? Just you. Mm -hmm. so, well, I wanted to comment if I could. I, I so appreciate the uptake, um, Lieutenant. Uh, it's, you know, it's been a passion of Ward 2 because most, you know, 90% of it's been taking place in Ward 2. And I really I pushed, <laughs> I really pushed for these um, increased penalties. Um, and has been at the council, just so people know, we're about to hear on Wednesday, the second reading of an ordinance that will move uh, trick racing it, out of driving and over into another section of law so that it won't be downgraded uh, from downgraded to a ticket. It'll remain a misdemeanor if I got that right. So that that's happening on Wednesday. And we wanted to get that passed before the bulk of the summer came. And then I also participated in with the team in drafting these new regulations um, that are under consideration. Now, you said that it was made a gross misdemeanor, but I didn't think the bill passed yet out of the legislature, but I might have missed that. Well, this one, Not I don't see the update in here, uh, but this I got this online. And it's NRS 44B.653. And the problem is, and you can't see it on the doors, sorry, but uh, it has like five, you know, it has reckless driving, organization of the speed contest, driving or facilitating, driving, you know, so it has like six different sections to it. And then it's like two pages long. So I think in the volumes of information, it was just easy to miss because I have 
It was, it was far away, so you can't see. But uh, well, anyway, what it says I, I, down here is the penalty. So it's just kind of one of those things that gets right. missed. But I think they're looking at adding additional things to it because this is right. simply the driver. And if anyone's seen these, um, good for you if you haven't. I know we've all heard them. Um, if you see these, it's kind of like a big ring of people in cars, and it's hundreds of people, and then two or three cars in the middle. So the way the statute is currently written, everybody hanging out is doing the misdemeanor, which really, really limits our ability to do much enforcement-wise. But the two people in the middle, like that's the gross misdemeanor, and that allows us to kind of arrest them. Um, you know, sometimes it depends on the circumstances, but we like to tow the car. Our policy supports it. The law supports it. Um, but it's not like an impoundment. So they get arrested, they go up, they bail out, and then they go get their car from the tow yard. They can literally be out the same night. So that's kind of the way it's written currently, and they're looking at changing a little bit of that. So we can impound the car for 30 days. The idea being one, it's a deterrent, and two, it, it generally racks up pretty significant fees. So that's true. Cause there's a daily fee, I think, for running. Yeah, space. it's ridiculous. Like I, I should own a tow yard. <laughs> I wouldn't have to do that. Exactly. I, my money. <laughs> I had a friend have this recently Absolutely. 220 for the tow and $40 a day for the rent. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, well, anyway, um, the one at the council is about spectating. So to your point about the big ring of people, um, there's been little we could do. And um, we are making, we are elevating spectating as a crime. That's the part that we're moving from driving to a different section of law so that we could deal with it. You know, there are concerns about First Amendment and are you watching, you know, do you have freedom of watching? And apparently it's considered participating in a crime. So um, anyway, we will be discussing this a second reading at council and we're trying to, we're trying all angles to get our handle on this before we get 10 years in. So good job. Any other copies? I'll scan a copy. I'll take one of them. I'll scan and distribute the NAB members electronically as well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. And any other, well, I generally take notes on you guys, and this is kind of format. So I I present at four of the five wards, and this is kind of the format that's generally preferred instead of me. My first one, I was like, and this went from this to this, and this went from it, like no one cared. And as soon as I was done talking, then the real questions came. Just kind of, I just picked like the top three. I look for patterns or things like that. Is that still acceptable with you guys? Yeah. yeah okay. Definitely. Is there anything for next time that you want me to research? Because um, if you have a question or someone has a question, uh, you can always get a hold of me on my email or go through uh, Tyler. He's, he's good about hey, they want to know about this. And he's give me a little time because some stuff takes time. I have to go to the crime. crime so, you know, so no gotcha questions from the. Uh, from the if you want to hit me, go ahead. Hit me. I'll, I'll, I'll make some. <laughs> well, that's okay because then we get better information. Yes, okay. uh, I, it's, it's, I like if you give me about. I need minimum a week, but if you can beat that, I'll have more sure. thorough uh, picture. To get. No, no, that's that's very fair. This, I, I have a quick, question. Okay, go ahead. For me. Um, so I got a call from a constituent in South Reno, and this is what they said. They said that the property, they're, they're in a Lennar development, and they said the property next to them, uh, Lennar is virtually abandoned. And so what's happened is that a lot of people have set up camps on that property. It, it basically, they're acting like it belongs to no one. Um, and I didn't know, since it is still technically private property, I told this person that I thought that Lennar should deed the property over to the HOA as open space so the HOA or the Landscape Man Maintenance Association could have some role in that. But right now it's just considered abandoned. And I don't know if you've dealt with this before, like just abandoned property, like property people claim no one owns. And is it like a no man's land or how do you yeah, deal with so that? So for us to be able to take any sort of enforcement, it has to be either fenced off or posted no trespassing. And that's generally at the behest of the property owner. And so we need, so it's kind of a weird legal explanation. It sounds dumb, but then it doesn't if you ever get sued. So if we go up there and we say, hey, you guys all have to leave, we all know, like everyone knows they have no legitimate right to be there unless it's like an adverse possession kind of thing they're trying to do. But generally speaking, everyone knows it. But until the property owner says that guy doesn't have permission to be on my property, 
there's there's not much we can do because we don't want to get sued. We don't want to take that liability. So it's just be a bad decision um, to take enforcement action based on that. So if they, like you're saying, generally what we do is we work with code enforcement and we go through the nuisance avenue and then they would find the property owner. And Alex Woodley's amazing at that kind of stuff uh, where they send a notice out to the property owner. And I see your smile. I know what you're going to do as soon as uh, yeah, you here tomorrow. Um, and so he's really good at sending those nuisance letters out to the property owner. And then they can either, like you're saying, uh, defer to someone else or they're going to start stacking up fines. Like I think you get a warning. And then like the second one within uh, six months, I think it's like a hundred dollars. And then they like double, like every time you get a nuisance violation. So uh, that generally motivates people is once you start getting those fines and all that stuff. And then they're, they'll either turn it over, they'll get the fencing on there. And once it's signed and fenced, um, we can meet with a property owner. And we, we do basically like a memo and they basically say, no one has a legitimate use. They put in some contact information. Um, and then we say, hey, there's people on your property. You know, yeah, no one's allowed to be there. And then now we're good to do. Gotcha. That's super helpful. I will share that. Anything else? My question, uh, yes. Patrick Fish, for the record, was uh, similar to that in that do any of your categories, um, it, tally, uh interactions with homeless uh, unhoused that have to be done? Forcibly um, removed from commercial properties, or no? Because we would just it would just be categorized as like the rogue crime, burglary, trespassing, something like that. That's not a, a data form we collect. Um, I know a lot of people want to know that, um, and I would like to see. I would love to see that statistic. Like we could just check a box or something like that. I'd also like to see people with uh, mental health issues because I think that's kind of a thing. Uh, I saw an article. I, I'm just speculating at the numbers. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they had you know. Before 2008, how many people were like in a lockdown facility? And then now the number was like maybe 10%, like, you know, nationally. And so basically all those people are out. So we don't, we don't think it's humane anymore to lock them up, but then they're roaming around. Right. You know, and generally a lot of the people that are have like a marginal mental health issue that can be medicated, um, just from my own personal interactions with, you know, hundreds of people over the years, they, they don't feel themselves weaned off. So they're like, I'm fine, I don't need to take my medicine. And then two, three days, a week goes by and they don't take it. And then now it's like slowly crept back in and they don't even know yeah. what's going on. Um, so we, we don't track it. Um, I think we just, we look at the crime specifically and then we look at like demographics, um, you know, race, age, things like that, um, of both suspect and victim kind of half and that's it, that's what the, the FBI and DOJ likes for their data collection. So that would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I'll see you guys next time. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. That brings us to skipping B2. Not one. It's now a different the agenda um, brings us to section C board commission meeting member reports and announcements. Does anybody on the board have anything that they'd like to announce? Well, I'll just say don't forget to uh, bring your stuff to the uh, trash event. Yeah, I. I worked the last one at Damani, or one of the last ones at Damani, and, and it was, uh, boy, it was busy the entire morning. I know. <laughs> We're uh, going to have to get tricky on how we set up the lines this time. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's going to be just as busy, if not busier, this time around, because people are, are now aware that uh, Ward 2 is doing this, and and uh, that it's a great way to get rid of a, a lot of stuff, so... Well, we've been so inspiring that other wards have adopted it as well. In fact, I think two or three wards have already gone before us in the previous weeks, um, and they're doing it too. So it was like we, we caught fire. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so moving on to item D, future agenda items. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to be 
able to place on a future agenda. Hearing well, I, 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 I would assume with regards to the Ward 6 matter, that's going to be an ongoing item on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. Also, I guess I'll just announce, I should have announced, um, I need to appoint a new planning commissioner um, as for starting July. Uh, my planning commissioner appointee has been Mark Johnson. He's an architect. They don't have to be an architect, um, but they do have to be a smart cookie. It's a, it's a challenging job with two meetings a month. The meetings often go six hours from six to midnight. Um, it's, it's tough duty, but they do incredible function for the city. So I just wanted to put it out there that I'm going to have to make that appointment here within like six weeks or sooner. Right. Um, item E, public comment. Last chance. I have another question. Oh, no. Okay. We're... <laughs> Go for it. Um, on this redistricting thing, I, I, I did talk to Kelly a couple weeks ago, and she, they, I believe they are going to do a similar kind of public outreach that they did last time. Yeah. They did a presentation at each war. They also had virtual and in person meetings along the way. Yeah. And they have online um, interactive uh, participation from the public. Like so a survey. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you could, like, this is where I would like to see these map boundaries go. And you make these statements about your neighborhood of interest and your community of interest, I think is the term. And I participated in all of it along the way, and I saw um, a great deal of responsiveness to those people who did attend and make statements and have opinions, ideas, suggestions, and there were several iterations of maps along the way, so I'm just saying this in case any of you were not part of that process the last time. Um, this time, I think it's going to be even more important because there'll be a buzz of people who want to be here and on their own board, but you know what? Maybe everybody else uses that area, so maybe the general public doesn't think that's the way it should go. It's going to possibly be a much bigger thing, and I think um, the city's going to mail postcards, I think, to every every resident, right, in the right. city, and that will have some of this information on it, and I just would encourage you to encourage everybody you know, this time above all, to participate as much as you can. It was a very well done uh, process last time and the public engagement was very large and very productive. Um, there were many people who were unaware and didn't even know their words had changed. So I would ask all of you to tell everyone you know that this is upcoming and you'll be getting a postcard soon. And this time more than ever, it's really important that you participate because they do actually tally everybody all the statements. They look at you know all the different reasons. It all it's it, I assume it will be at least as good as it was last time, and that's kind of a big deal. So tell everyone you know when you get your postcard, don't throw it away because it's it's super easy to participate. I mean, I did spend quite a lot of time on it because there were a lot of meetings, but um, it was well worth it. I think, and um, I think it will be even more worth it this time because it, it, the issues are way more important on a personal level about your council person and your your community of interest and how you, you hang together with the people that you want to, you know, it's just it's kind of a big deal. So on that vein, may I want to ask you, um, I didn't hear anything at last week's council meeting about what happens to the to the NAPs at that point. Like you put well, a group of people, so we may be not Ward 2 NAB, we might be Ward 7 NAB, you know, whatever. Right. Do the people that and do? I mean it, it would probably be up to the person and their term but let's say I'm just giving an example let's say you do live in the way south Reno and that ends up getting redistricted into ward three or something um then you might want to think about joining a ward three nap um you know I don't see me kicking anybody off that wants to continue participating but they might be more effective especially since the areas are going to be smaller uh, it'll be a focused concentration. So and, that's and how I see way, it going. And by the way, we should encourage you when people talk to us about something that's going on, like the Ward 6 thing or something, tell them to come to the NAB meeting 
because they'll get a chance to get on the record then yes. in a way that they may not at a regular council meeting. So it's a good chance to, you know, if we've got a bunch of people sitting in those seats who are, who are invigorated about a particular issue, then I think that may carry, hopefully that will carry some weight and we should encourage people to come here and, and participate. Yeah. Yes, I think that's very important as well. I do speak about these meetings frequently to friends and family who like have questions. Um, and I do encourage them to come. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But um, they've also found it really helpful, the fact that these meetings are on YouTube. Um, so I do see that they go and watch those meetings afterwards. And sometimes if they have like any questions, like I may be able to answer them or I tell them, you know, reach out to anyone sure. else who may have them, but like, you know, like it, it does show that people are interested yeah. in what happens here. And yeah, I think it, it's it very important. Be that interactive relationship between the communities and, and, and that. Yes, absolutely. All right. Any other public comment? If anyone attending the meeting virtually would like to give public comment, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Mr. Chair, we have no public comment. Yeah, very good. I'd uh, move to item F, uh, take a motion for adjournment. Move to adjourn. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, bye.